OK. And so what I was saying is that we have this singularity category, which I tend to think of as the derived category of a directed Fukai category. And this, for the ADE case, is equivalent to derived quiver representations. And last time we talked about how this Euler form for this quiver has this property where this S is the Ser functor on the growth and deek group of the category. Now, the Ser functor, in some sense, gives monodromy on the opposite side. And so eigenvalues of this are in the circle. And in particular, if we remember, the spectrum of a singularity consists of logarithms of the eigenvalues of monodromy. Now, what logarithms in particular um, we can't just find from S. And the point of last time was that if we write this as 1 minus a different matrix, and then we parameterize the whole situation in terms of a parameter t, where a naught is equal to 0, and a of 1 is equal to a, where chi of t inverse times chi of t tau it has eigenvalues in monodromy. Eigenvalues in S1, I should say. All right, if we do this situation, we choose this naturally. and. We sort of went over what naturally means last time. And then we can watch these eigenvalues sort of drift around the circle. And maybe they go the other way, right? In the example we did last time, some of the eigenvalues of d4 went counterclockwise and some went clockwise. And the whole point was watching this circular motion you can count how many times these eigenvalues wrap around the circle. And that gives you the integral part of your logarithm, essentially determining the spectrum, but up to a shift. This gives spectrum of what's called spectrum of a matrix. And then after a shift, I think this was the shift. I can't remember now. But after this shift, we get the spectrum of a function in certain cases, right? We went over this is specifically for the ADE case, but this also holds for chain type singularities, right? The reason that we have to do this shift uh, on, in a moral sense is because this category does not remember the dimension of the singularity, OK? The derived, you know, the singularity category, um, because of this nor periodicity result, doesn't remember the dimension of the original function that defined it. And so by a stabilization procedure, right, I could add x squared or some new, ver new squared variable to my singularity, I would get the same derived category back, uh, up to some equivalence, right? And so that's why I need this shift here, is this shift is basically remembering, uh, remembering what dimension I started with. All right, that's the purpose of this shift. So if I know the spectrum of my s, or sorry, I should really write chi here. I always mix these up. Spectrum of my chi is the spectrum up to a shift by dimension. So sort of the motivating question for the second part of the talk last week, uh, one that I didn't actually answer, was this question about uh, why. Right. 
what's going on here? The answer <coughs> basically has to do with Frobenius manifolds. Right? Remember, we have this construction of the Frobenius manifold. for some local singularity and the construction was basically we take a universal deformation of the singularity This is the Jacobian algebra. Right. We take a universal deformation. And then we can identify the tangent bundle of some ball in uh, C mu space. So some ball of radius theta in C mu space. This is going to be our base for our Frobenius manifold. And the Frobenius manifold structure exists on the tangent bundle to this. And basically, the fibers of this tangent bundle are identified with the Jacobian algebra at that point. All right, so we have this sort of bundle of Jacobian algebras. The Frobenius manifold structure then corresponds to, well, we always have this two tensor, this multiplication is just multiplication in the fibers, multiplication of functions, right? A Frobenius manifold always comes with an identity. Well, this identity here for us is 1 in the fibers. And a Frobenius manifold always comes with an Euler field. And for us, this Euler field is f. I really should put the class of f in the fibers. Now note that uh, at least in the zero fiber for a quasi-homogeneous singularity this vanishes. So for quasi-homogeneous singularities at least on the zero fiber this Euler field will vanish. So for nice singularities the structure is a bit simpler. So we have this map, which is just F. This is our Milner fibration. All right. This is our Milner fibration map. And then we modify this Milner fibration map slightly by just adding in sort of an extra coordinate on the codomain. This delta is just a disk in this original C. This codomain of f, it's a disk in this original C. All right, we sort of localize. We have to take small enough balls around everything to sort of get this local picture to work correctly. And so the, one of the main constru constructions of our Frobenius manifold was, or one of the main problems, I suppose, was constructing a metric. So it's not too hard to just get a metric on the Frobenius manifold. Basically, the metric came from taking Id an identification of the tangent bundle with uh, these relative forms, these top dimensional relative forms uh, over, you know, with respect to f. This gives some sort of metric, which is the last piece 
of our Frobenius manifold picture. The problem is that this depends on a choice. And this metric that we got uh, was possibly not flat. And we need it to be flat. Right. So the way we get a flat metric was rather involved. So let me just uh, define my critical locus. The way we got to this was we basically take a lattice inside the cohomological Milner vibration. So restrict ourselves to just looking at cohomology. We took this lattice. This is, in some sense, the Brieskorn lattice over the whole semi-universal unfolding. This is the lattice in, uh, in H, which is the homological element vibration. And then we did a series of operations, or at least I just outlined how this series of operations roughly goes. Right? We didn't really do anything. But it sort of takes a long time to develop, so this is the best you're going to get for now, where we just extend this vibration over C. So this is a rather trivial extension. But then extending it over P1 isn't so trivial. This is. This step is roughly a classical picture, which is solving the Birkhoff problem. So not only solving the Birkhoff problem, but since we have a family of connections here, a family parameterized over M, the base of our uh, the base of our Frobenius manifold. This connection I'm talking about is coming just from the cohomological Milner vibration. So it's the Gauss-Menin connection. So this is just solving the Birkhoff problem in a family, going from here to here. Now, in general, you can do this um, by finding filtrations on the, you can find filtrations on the multi-valued sections of this right here. So finding filtrations on the multi-valued section of this will give us extensions here. So I'm not going to construct one, but uh, you can find these. And after we do, we can talk about the push forward of this thing this extended Brieskorn lattice to just M. So now we do have just an honest to God connection over M. And this thing, this extended Brieskorn lattice, has residue at infinity with eigenvalues that are the negatives of the spectrum of the singularity. So this is nice, uh, but one question would be, why does this happen, right? The last part of this is that we have a before I talk about why this happens, maybe the last part about this is, you know, I started wanting to find a, a, uh, a metric which is flat. So if you pick a V1, which is an eigenvector of uh, negative alpha 1, then V1 defines a period map at 0 on the 0 fibers, sending, sending x to this. Okay. 
this defines a map. So we get Tm0. We've got this V1 map that goes to this Brieskorn lattice. But this Brieskorn lattice is naturally inside this omega f that we were talking about before. This omega f, at least the zero fiber, which was giving us these metrics. And so we get a map, we get a commutative diagram that looks like this. This is commutative. So this map here, which is given just by choosing some volume form, uh, commutes with this map, which is this V1 map, and then composed with this, uh, this sort of natural map that we get just from the inclusion of this thing into our relative forms. Okay. And so this allows us to sort of define a metric on this, at least in the zero fiber that's flat, by choosing this V1 as our volume form. Now, it's not so simple, but uh, you know, this is a uh, this is not the place to sort of talk about the proof, I suppose. So, you know, this is not obvious, but uh, this does give you a flat metric. Okay, so before I go on, it might be sort of mysterious, at least to some people, this part, right? I said, okay, well, I'm going to explain maybe, well, at least I'm going to try to explain some of these ex uh, appearances in the singularity category through Frobenius manifolds, but why is this appearing in the first place, I suppose? Right? So the reason why it appears in the first place is sort of classical. I mean, all this is classical, but let's go back even further. So to explain this, I would need to talk just about the local Brieskorn lattice. And why the local Brieskorn lattice encodes the spectrum. So thinking locally, so I have my classical picture. If I take, say, this cohomological Milner fibration locally, so this is the cohomological Milner fibration, not for my semi-universal deformation, but just for f. Right? We'll keep it simple here. And so I also have this sheaf of sections that comes equipped with a natural connection, this uh, you know, Gaussman in connection, topological Gaussman in connection. If I look on the fibers, I can decompose each fiber into an eigenspace. And this eigenspace is with respect to the monogamy, which I can also break up into semi-simple and unipotent parts. So in particular, I'm just going to be looking at the eigenspaces of the semi-simple part. So the story of this Brieskorn lattice and why it's important involves multi-valued sections, right? The reason that we were going to talk about multi-valued sections is because uh, we want to get at sort of logarithms of the uh, eigenvalues of monogamy, right? These eigenvalues of monogamy, I want to get at certain logarithms of them. And so we sort of have to talk about these things. So talking about the multi-valued sections is essentially just talking about this commutative diagram, right, where this is my e and this is my pullback. Right, this is just the exponential function. So multi-valued sections are just these things. They're global sections of the pullback.
So my set of multi-valued sections looks like this. And the whole point is that even if we have a multi-valued section, we can sort of untwist it if we choose a logarithm of monogamy. So choosing alpha, which is some, sorry, choosing alpha, which is some logarithm of monogamy, we get this map. That's an isomorphism. What this map does is it takes a multi-valued section and it untwists it. So it untwists it with respect to our chosen logarithm. So this allows us to identify the eigenspace with a bunch of these different untwisted eigenspaces. And we have this, these nice properties where all of these are related in a very nice way. Multiplication by z goes from c alpha to c alpha plus 1. And taking the connection gives us an isomorphism from c alpha to c alpha minus 1. Also, this connection is naturally related to the monogamy. It's n, where n is the logarithm of the unipotent part. So the whole point about this, yes? Oh, this is the, just the exponential function. Yeah. So this is the, you know, the universal covering. Right, so we're pulling back. Yeah, it's just C. So what I can do with this is that we have what's called the V filtration of these sections. And the Brieskorn lattice, so the story is that to any sort of lattice of this cohomological Milner fibration, so right now I'm going to focus on just the central fiber because it's the most important thing. So I'm going to focus on the central fiber of this, where I goes from uh, C star into C, just the inclusion map. And the whole point is that this whole story can just be carried over. We get this nice identity. And this push forward decomposes into a nice decomposition of these C alphas. So this is dimension mu over this thing. Right. Now, when we talk about lattices, we really only want to talk about lattices that have sort of moderate growth. So we're going to restrict our attention to this. I mean, this is itself a lattice, but I won't be really thinking of it as one. So I'm going to restrict myself to this, this part. And the whole point of this is that I don't really want to consider things with like uh, essential singularities or anything like that. So this is the s sections of moderate growth. 
So I'm looking at these multi-valued sections of moderate growth, but I'm looking at them sort of in the zero fiber. And the point is, to any lattice, any other lattice, L, I can compare that lattice with this V filtration. This V filtration is giving me sort of like, it's chopping up the analytic data uh, around this singularity, at least the stuff that's encoded by the cohomology. And so any other lattice I can sort of compare with this V filtration. And this comparison, depending on how uh, you know, intelligently I choose my lattice, this comparison will yield invariance. And for a particular lattice, the Brieskorn lattice, our invariance are th is the spectrum. So. So, so to any lattice, oh, I didn't even finish my sentence. We can associate not only a spectrum, but also a filtration. A filtration of the many-valued sections, multi-valued sections. So the comparison, the way we, you know, when I say compare the lattices together, what I mean is I'm going to take graded pieces. Maybe I should write this where I have some more room. Graded pieces of the V filtration are just these C alphas. That's really just by design. And so I'm just taking the parts of my lattice that are inside, you know, these C alphas. The picture sort of looks like this. We have negative one. You can imagine this on a real line. And this real line represents sort of the parameter of my V filtration to every piece on this real line, any alpha, I have a C alpha. So these are the graded pieces. The verticals are just the graded pieces. So I'm slicing up. Uh, so this is going to be, I'm slicing up my V greater than negative infinity, I suppose. And I can represent the other lattice by, say, a diagonal. So it just can't be parallel. So something like this. Maybe this is alpha plus 1. Where this lattice, instead of how the V filtration is filtrating in that direction, this lattice filtrates in this direction. This is not like a, I'm not, this is not like a vector space or anything I'm looking at. This is just a mental picture of how you can organize these things. And so what happens is I get the pieces of this lattice, L, which are in these C alphas, look like these shaded pieces. But remember that my multiplication by z takes anything in C alpha to C alpha plus 1. And so I can look at this piece pushed over by z into the next piece. And the spectrum I associate to my lattice L are just the collection of these dimensions. So these dimensions give, so I should say, dimension non-zero gives alpha in spec of L. All right, so the non-zero pieces, any time I get a non-zero dimension like this, that means that this alpha is inside the spectrum of this lattice. It's the def definition of the spectrum of the lattice. And so the Brieskorn lattice is a very particular lattice. And when I take this Brieskorn lattice, 
I'm getting the spectrum of the function, the spectrum of the singularity. So choosing L equals the Brescorn lattice. spectrum I associate to L is just the spectrum of my singularity. Now, not only do we have the spectrum, but this picture encodes all of the Hodge filtration as well, the Hodge filtration of the singularity. I should say that maybe I haven't defined this, but it's uh, the m plus 1 forms at 0 mod the f wedge the n minus 1 forms at 0. So how you get the Hodge filtration looks roughly like this. I look at these C alphas that are in between negative 1 and 0. And then I look at alpha plus p, where p is some integer. And the lattice that I choose should give some picture like this. And the whole point is that I can take z to the negative pth power, and I can look at this graded lattice piece in my piece that's in between negative 1 and 0. So this picture gives my Hodge filtration, or my filtration of my multivalued section. Uh, there's a slight thing here, which is if I actually want to give, it, give the pl classical picture, I have to do this n minus which gives the actual Hodge filtration of f according to Orchenko. Now, there's a different Hodge filtration according to Steenbrink. And maybe I'll just make a slight note about this. They both give the same spectral numbers, but uh, if you really do care about this sort of Hodge information, then just note that, you know, considering everything as microdifferential modules, gives uh, Steenbrink's Hodge filtration. Yeah, so this whole story can be replicated by thinking of these objects as modules over the microdifferential operators instead of modules just over sort of converging power series at zero. And doing that will just give you Steenbrink's filtration instead. So this picture will kind of flip because remember that the this thing acts sort of you can draw the picture yourself, but that's the idea. Uh, yeah, so I think I maybe wrote this down last time. I can't remember. But this is uh, the set of these, looks like this. Uh, where these coefficients satisfy uh, this. Uh, something like that. Oh. So polynomials in this inverse. So this is like integration. So like polynomials and integration uh, 
such that the polynomial has some sort of nice bounded property. Okay, so this is the classical picture. And this is sort of why when we talk about the, the Frobenius manifold, we specifically, when we try to construct this metric, pick the Brescorn lattice as sort of our playground to construct the metric in. And that's why when we do construct this metric, we get this, uh, these, the spectrum appearing, you know, as residues of this, as residues at infinity. Okay. So now I need to segue into the next part of my talk, which is about these structure connections. Because really, I've defined the Frobenius manifold, but I haven't really talked anything about sort of why this connects to the examples I was giving before. And so to define this structure connection, we sort of lift everything. to 1 cross m. So everything lifts. So remember this nabla, now we're not talking about the gaussman in connection, but this nabla, since we're going back to the Frobenius manifold picture, this is levi Savita. And I have this. I have these two new operators to talk about, which this first operator is just nabla in the direction of whatever I input with E times this. So if I put in some vector here, the vector goes here and the vector goes here. So this is a new operator that I'm defining. And so the reason that we define this operator is sort of to encode the action of the levi Savita connection with this Euler field. And we also have another operator that encodes the action of the levi Savita connection, or not, not the levi Savita connection. It encodes the uh, action of this multiplication with the Euler field. And so from this, I can define two different connections, which are called the first and the second structure connections of my Frobenius manifold. And this will sort of be the object that connects most of these examples. So we get from this, we get the first structure connection, which acts like this. where the z is just a coordinate on the, uh, on the base of the Frobenius manifold. And we get that if we take, specifically if we take in the z direction, this connection, then it looks like the levi Savita connection in that direction, just like this. Uh, but then we get to this plus 1 over z. And we encode this operator. I ran out of space, but this is also plus this. Yeah. So this is defined really on C star cross M. And the whole point is that this has a pole of order 2 at infinity and a pole of order, a log pole at 0. So the picture, I suppose, looks something like this, where we have this is our delta, this is 0, this is infinity, this is sort of a log pole all along this line, and over here, this is a pole of order 2. Right? All this means is that locally around these, we can express this in terms of you know, matrices of holomorphic functions uh, all over 
over, say, z squared over here, and then all over, say, z over here. We also get this second structure connection, which will actually be a familiar object. So this is the first structure connection. And then over here, I have my second structure connection. And so the second structure connection looks like this. And once again, I ran out of room. Okay. That's in the x direction, and then specifically in the uh, dz direction, I look like this. So this might not look familiar, but this is the gauss in connection. After some sort of restriction, right? So, so this connection that I was talking about in the classical case, where we have this connection that we're extending with a lattice. Uh, if we talk about that whole picture over the semi-universal deformation of the function, this gauss this second structure connection is the Gauss-Menin connection. And uh, if I draw a picture like I did over here, it doesn't have quite the same structure because it doesn't have uh, order two poles. because the Gauss-Menin connection is regular. So this, actually, it's not even going to look like this. It's going to look like this. Because it's going to have a regular pole over here. We just have this pole over 0. But here, we have poles all over this discriminant locus that are log poles. And we also have log poles at infinity. So the Stokes matrix for this thing, the first structure connection, the connection with you know the, the whole point, well, maybe not the whole point, but one of the things I want to emphasize is this chi from before is just the Stokes matrix of this connection. All right. So we have this pole of order 2 at infinity. And so unlike for regular poles, log poles, um, the sort of the formal solutions to this thing at infinity cannot just be readily uh, analytized or made analytic. We can only make them analytic in sectors around infinity. Right? So we might have a sector that looks like this, where this is the whole sector. And we might have a sector that looks like this, where this is the whole sector. And on these intersections, right, basically, on each of those sectors, you can define, you can make those formal solutions analytic. But on these intersections, uh, you can have two different ways of making those formal solutions analytic. And so the Stokes matrix tells you how to pass from one set of solutions to the other set. 
right? So this chi from before is the Stokes matrix of this connection. And to some extent, the Stokes matrix um, sort of classifies the data about the connection. So this Frobenius manifold encodes really important information about the uh, about the spectrum, especially at infinity. And this Stokes matrix of the first structure connection at infinity is actually encoding the spectrum. We can see this at a categorical level. Now, let's see. One thing to note is that we can recover most of this from our structure connections. So I don't have that much time, so maybe I won't write it down. Uh, but basically, if you look at this picture, if we localize around sort of my log pole at zero, I can recover my V. So I can recover V and my Levi uh, Levi Savita connection by just considering the residue connection around zero. That's going to be V. And then. Uh, the connection that that defines is going to be my Levi Savita connection. So around infinity, sorry. sorry, this picture is opposite. This goes over here. Around infinity, I can get this information. Around zero, I can recover uh, my u. So around 0, if I localize here, I can recover my u. I'm confusing myself by switching in between these things. I had it right the first time. Around infinity, I can recover my u by just maybe, if I just want to be easy with myself, I'll switch the coordinates. Make z tilde just to be 1 over z. My first structure connection becomes something like k over z squared dz plus the sum of these ai's over z dti. And this k, negative k ut, this is going to be my u, or at least encodes u, and negative a0t is encoding my multiplication. Right. So the first structure connection packages all of the Frobenius manifold information in a nice, neat way. Second structure connection does the same thing, but uh, it won't be as important, so I won't go over it. And one thing to note is there's a relationship between this first structure connection and the second structure connection. So the second structure connection we know, it's a Gauss-Menin connection. These two are Fourier, Fourier Laplace duals of each other. So if you take a Fourier Laplace transformation, you can go from one to the other. Right? So these connections are Fourier Laplace duals. And so one of the things that I want to talk about, and a related subject, is that this thing, this first structure connection, is very important. This thing defines, or is, maybe I shouldn't say defines, it's a piece of the non commutative mixed Hodge structure. for my function. 
Now, one thing I wanted to talk about was that you can actually recover the spectrum of the singularity from up to a shift from this non-commutative mixed Hodge structure uh, in a purely categorical way. So this is a piece of this, and I suppose I should get a, give a really quick definition of what this is. Non-commutative mixed Hodge structure is just a vector bundle on C with something isomorphic to the restriction of the vector bundle, the C star, so a local system inside of it, where the induced delta has poles of order 2 at 0, order 1 at infinity. And B is compatible with, with the Stokes structure. And I won't go into what that means. There's also another condition about you know, trivializing this over P1, but uh, it's not important for what I want to talk about. So this delta is this thing. So that defines a non-commutative Hodge structure for this function. And if you read this, uh, this paper that originally defined these things, uh, they give an example of a non-commutative Hodge structure for these functions, and this is it. I mean, they don't say it in this language, but it's, it should be the same thing, I think. I'm pretty sure it's the same thing. Maybe up to some shift, it's not. So for the last couple of minutes, I'll just go over some quick results, or maybe not some quick results, but just some quick notes. This isn't a theorem, but uh, this is due to Shklerov. Uh, so this connection, or maybe this uncommutative mixed Hodge structure, can be reconstructed from the singularity category maybe up to a shift because of course dimensional reasons Okay, and not only can you recover this non-commutative mixed Hodge structure, but uh, you can recover sort of the Brieskorn lattice. Um, so you can recover also formal version of the Brieskorn lattice and spectral numbers. Up to a shift, right. up to a shift. So once again, the category doesn't remember the dimension. Doesn't remember the dimension of our singularity. So I'm about out of time, but uh, one thing that maybe I'll talk about in another talk is But there's also some other things that appear here. And so the formal solutions, or sh maybe I should say the uh, information about solutions to this uh, recovers the spectrum. We also have that uh, there's this sort of mysterious relationship where the Calabi Yau dimension of the ADE singularity category
is always alpha mu minus alpha one. Now, I haven't really seen this written down anywhere, but I, I expect that this is just well known. People, that this is just a well known observation, but this always happens. And to my knowledge, this should happen in general. Now, what do I mean by in general? Because in general, these singularity categories aren't going to be Calabi out. But we, rep we replace CY dimension with SER dimension. And when I say that it should happen, I just say I expect it to happen. I, I don't know if it actually does. So at least in the two variable case, singularities of two variables, uh, this is almost absolutely true. right? Um, it's, it's absolutely true for uh, uh, Brescore and Fam singularities, for sure. And it's sort of trivial for Brescore and Fam singularities. At least it's trivial after you compute. So maybe the quick example would be, you know, AN has CY dimension n plus 1, or sorry, n minus 1 over n plus 1. And for AN, the at least maybe the Saito formulation of the Hodge numbers is 1 over n plus 1 over n over n plus 1. So take the biggest minus the smallest, you get the Calabi out dimension. And so you can talk about all of at least the Brescore and Fam singularities in two dimensions as being tensor products of these categories. And it's known that the tensor product of two categories, the Calabi Yau dimension is additive. So you add those things up and you can uh, you can show that this is this is definitely true for those singularities. I think it should be true in general. So this is connected to the Frobenius manifold as well. Because this A mu minus A1 uh, by this result of I believe Hertling is uh, is the variance of the spectrum in like the statistical sense. How far, you know, how far these things vary from each other. And uh, the proof of that is very much dependent on the Frobenius manifold. There's this G function of the Frobenius manifold uh, that sort of encodes this data. And uh, more than that, this A mu minus A1, or alpha mu minus alpha 1, is in some sense the dimension of the Frobenius manifold. Not in like a complex dimension sense, but in, um, in the sense that maybe if I give another talk, I'll, I'll go over. So there's this theorem, of, or it's not a theorem, but there's this note by uh, Shukalov that uh, you can reconstruct this connection from just the singularity category. There's a, this idea that asymptotics of this should recover the spectrum. And there's also this sort of mysterious thing happening with the biggest minus the smallest spectral number being related to dimensional information about the category. Um, and I think I'm just about uh, I'm over time. So maybe I'll stop there. Uh, questions? Any question? So, yeah. So, any question? So, in this Calabria category, Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is this well known? This is the uh, alpha mu, alpha mu. This Calabi out dimension? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can just compute. I mean, there's only so many of them. You can just compute them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Calabi out dimensions, and you can just check. Oh. Right? But I, I don't know of any sort of general, like, you know, deep proof as to why this happens. 
Um, you know, you can say morally, like, Calabiao dimension is about the serifuncter. Serifuncter encodes monodromy on the mirror side. And so, you know, talking about eigenvalues of monodromy is sort of talking about, like, powers of the serifuncter. So you might be able to make an argument there, but, uh, you know, I'm not sure. Um, but you can certainly just compute these things and, and see how it works. Yeah. This, I mean, this you can just compute by, uh, you, if you think about it as a quiver category, so take it the derived category of a quiver, there's this uh, oslander Reiten quiver. And uh, the serif functor on this oslander Reiten quiver is just a translation. It's called the AR translation. Maybe up to a sign, I can't remember. Um, and so you can just sort of watch all of the things in this category move around, and you sort of just get this number. It's, it's a fairly simple calculation. And then the other expectation is if you replace this by for arbitrary singularity, right? Arbitrary singularity. Yeah, I don't know how nice the singularity needs to be, but I, I would expect uh, for these, like, you know, isolated singularities and you know I, I don't know the further you go away the more I just have to say you know it seems like it should be true but uh, I'm not sure right I think for uh, I think it's sort of expected to be true in general at least for like uh, Lando Ginsburg models right. so I should say that there's um, there's sort of a global story that I'm not talking about here, which is this is all about sort of local singularities. But you can talk about global functions. And you know, in geometry, when we talk about Landau-Ginsberg models, we sort of want to talk about global functions. So the construction of the Frobenius manifold in this whole story is sort of different, um, mainly because for dimensional reasons, you can't run the same construction. So you have to construct a Frobenius manifold using these oscillating integrals. Um, and in general, it's, I don't know if there's a general, like a general construction, but that's like the, the idea of how you should do it is construct them using oscillating integrals. So, so the global situation is sort of slightly different. Um, but for local isolated singularities, uh, I, I think that this should happen. Um, there's also, I mean, this should actually happen for quantum cohomology too. So the whole point is that these non-commutative Hodge structures can also be defined for quantum cohomology of some sort of uh, variety. And so there, you're also going to get sort of asymptotic information about the solutions to this uh, non-commutative Hodge structure, at least the flat sections of this non-commutative Hodge structure. And then taking differences of like, uh, so you can, as you can sort of assign um, a spectrum to it. And you can take sort of the biggest spectral number minus the smallest one. And uh, you know, I, I believe in this talk of Konsevich, he talked about how this was also supposed to run the same, the same sort of way that these were supposed to give uh, sort of ser dimensions of certain semi-orthogonal decompositions of the category. Uh, so in some ways, this is maybe the same, the same story as the quantum cohomology case, but uh, maybe it's simpler, maybe, I, I don't know. OK, great. So no other question? Okay, if then let's thanks to August again.